Greetings, greetings, greetings. I am your host, Jamal Brown. You are tuned in to another exciting episode, informative episode, educational episode of the Gist of Freedom radio show. Again, I am your host, Jamal Brown, founder and creator of Black365.com, home of a myriad of educational products. And tonight, we will be covering a host of topics all surrounding the tiny island of Jamaica. Jamaica has been in the news for a number of reasons as of late, many of which you may be familiar with, some that you may not be familiar with necessarily. Jamaica recently celebrated its Independence Day. That's right, August 6th, 1963, if my memory serves me correctly, the island of Jamaica celebrated its independence, excuse me, 1962, 1962. Uh, again, the island of Jamaica celebrated its independence. Jamaica has a whole host of individuals who have shaped history as we know it. But I wanted to get tonight started off with a quotation. Quotations give us a foundation, a, a, a basis, a point of beginning. And here is a powerful quotation from one of the most powerful minds in our history. This quotation comes from, from us from the incomparable intellect walking library. This man has taught me more since he has transitioned than I can say anyone in life about history, African American history, African history, Black history, the greatness of who we are, that being none other than Dr. John Henry Clark. One of my favorite quotations is provided here. He says, history is a clock that people use to tell the political and cultural time of day. It is a compass they use to find themselves on the map of human geography. It tells them where they are, but more importantly, what they must be. There are so many things that we can pick apart from this quotation, so many pieces, so many parts, so many facets, but I just love the, 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 the poetic nature of this poignant statement. History is a clock that people use to tell the political and cultural time of day. Again, just like a clock tells you the hour, tells you where you are at in relation to the sun, where you are at in relation to others. Again, he says history, allows you to find out what time it is. In Swahili, people say, what's the news? You know, what, what, what's happening in African American culture? What's happening? What's up? What time is it? And back in the 60s, people would say, what time is this liberation time? But again, Dr. Clark says, history is a clock that people use to tell the political and cultural time of day. It is a compass that you find, that people find themselves on the map of human geography. And like I said, today, we're going to look at a map and we're going to look particularly in the Caribbean Sea, the Caribbean Ocean, Caribbean Sea, at this country known as Jamaica. Jamaica, as you know, is the home of the Honorable Marcus Garvey. It is the home of Bob Marley. It is the home of several Maroons. I recently realized that the term Maroon is a term that people may not necessarily be familiar with, but I'll tell you what a Maroon is. A Maroon is a town or an encampment or a collective of people, formerly enslaved people, who have exhibited self-determination. People who said that, hey, the birds are free, the fish are free, and it only makes sense that God made people free too. So formerly enslaved people on the island of Jamaica would run away, would steal away in the night, would escape in layman's terms, and they would form themselves in what would be called maroon towns, or just simply maroons. There, they would strike back at imperialism, they would strike back at colonialism, they would strike back at the enslavers. Through asymmetric warfare or guerrilla warfare, they would sneak in the night and strike the plantations that they were formerly enslaved on, stealing cows, stealing chickens. Or can you even call it stealing when you're doing what you are doing in order to survive. 
if someone has stolen you and you steal from someone who stole you, is, is, is stealing the right word? I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, the, the English language isn't quite expansive enough to quite articulate the, that message, I think. But there were people who would fight for their freedom, fight for the freedom of others in Jamaica and places called Maroons. And one of the most valiant fighters, one of the most intelligent fighters, one of the most honorable fighters from the island of Jamaica, we know her as Queen Nanny, or simply Nanny for short. Queen Nanny was a Maroon leader. She was from the Ashanti nation, or the Ashanti tribe of Ghana, West Africa. Who else was from the Ashanti tribe? Take a minute, go through the recesses of your mind, your mental database. What other freedom fighter that we talk about here on the Just a Freedom Radio Show comes from the Ashanti tribe? Time's up. That person, none other than Queen Harriet. Harriet Tubman, Harriet Tubman comes to us from the Ashanti tribe as well. But today we're talking about this freedom fighter known as Queen Nanny. We feature her in some of our Black 365 products. You can find out black365.com or blackhistorycards.com. Uh, but Queen Nanny, as I mentioned, was an intelligent warrior, was a fearless warrior, was a maroon leader from the Ashanti tribe of Ghana, West Africa, forced to, into enslavement along with her brothers, Cujo and others. And each and every one of her brothers and herself stole away, broke away, and were the leaders of men, leaders of women, and leaders of freedom-fighting children who lived in the Blue Mountains of Jamaica. These were hard-to-reach places where they would steal away and create encampments and constantly and consistently plan, constantly and consistently fight against colonization, constantly and consistently fight for freedom. When the British could not stop Queen Nanny, when the British could not corral her, when the British could not break the will or the spirit of Queen Nanny, they sought to create treaties. They wanted to meet with her at the negotiating table. Each and every one of the treaties that was signed or agreed upon, or the agreements uh, were gained with Queen Nanny, the British broke time and time again. But again, they did not break the will, did not break the spirit, did not break the mentality, did not break the fervor of Queen Nanny or her freedom-seeking fighters, freedom-seeking kin that she lived with. For her efforts, for her valiant spirit, for her warrior mentality, for being the person that she is, the Jamaican government, after she died, several years after she died, memorialized her on the $500 bill in Jamaica. She is the only one, the only female to be recognized as a, um, as a national hero. Jamaica, I believe, has seven national heroes. Queen Annie, is the only of Jamaica's seven national heroes. And when someone is um, entrusted with or bestowed the title of a national hero in Jamaica, they are given the term or given the phrase that they're able to put in front of their name, the right excellent. So, so she is properly called the right excellent Queen Nanny. And here we see her her likeness featured on the $500 banknote or $500 bill, which is the largest bill in the Jamaican circulation, Jamaican society. Again, on the Just a Freedom radio show, if you listen back at our previous shows, we've been talking about memorials. We have been talking about symbols that have been erected, symbols that have been passed down, symbols that exist that showcase the greatness of a people. Symbols since the beginning of time have been created by man in order to convey a message. Symbols recognize and showcase to the world the hope, 
the spirit, the intentions of a people. Going far back since the beginning of time, the ancient Egyptians we covered in a previous episode erected Tekken or Tekenu or obelisks. And these were symbols of resurrection. Each time you see a Tekken, each time you see an obelisk in ancient Egypt or anywhere throughout the world, we mentioned that there is one in Washington DC that's known as the Washington Monument. We mentioned that there's one located in Paris, one located in London, and one located in New York's Central Park that was stolen from Egypt. This symbol of assured resurrection, a symbol of power, a symbol of dominance, a symbol that showcases to the world we are in alignment with our creator and we will continue to rise. Symbols are important, statues are important, memorials, mementos are important. So it is no small feat that Queen Nanny will forever be memorialized in the hearts and minds of all who know of her valiancy, of her strength, of her fierce fighting. Again, here is the $500 bill that showcases the face and the likeness of Queen Nanny. Next up, we have this outstanding warrior. She was not necessarily a warrior on a battlefield, but she was the warrior when it comes to the political arena. I'm talking about none other than, I don't even know what term to give her. Right, excellent, honorable, queen. I'm talking about Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm, we've talked about Jamaica. We've talked about, now we're gonna talk about women in politics. We're tying all this together. Here at the Just of Freedom Radio, we don't just talk about history for history's sake. There is no such thing in our, in our minds as history for history's sake. History shows us the future. When you really begin to analyze, when you really begin to look at and dig deep into history, it all is a circle and all circles back to itself. Shirley Chisholm is this country's first African-American female congressperson. She represented the great state of New York in pop quiz. What feat did Shirley Chisholm accomplish? Again, we've heard her name perhaps recently as uh, 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 women reached different heights in terms of politics. Well, Shirley Chisholm was the first African-American male or female to receive a major party nomination for President of the United States, the first African-American. She laid the foundation for Jesse Jackson in 1988, for Barack Obama in 2008, and most certainly for Ms. Kamala Harris here in the year 2020, as she has recently received the nomination or the um, delegation of uh, vice president candidate for the United States of America. And it was in the early 1970s where Shirley Chisholm, representing again herself in the great state of New York, um, had a slogan that she was unbought and unbossed. Unbought and unbossed. Really that means she was uncompromising in her stance, uncompromising in her politics, uncompromising when it came, when it came to the seriousness that she exhibited for her people. Shirley Chisholm too has Jamaican roots. Although she was born in this country, born in uh, the state of New York, she had Jamaican roots as well. Some of that Queen Nanny blood, some of that Queen Nanny energy undoubtedly was in the veins, in the spirit, in the essence, in the aura of this great Congresswoman, of this great political figure that we know in the form of Shirley Chisholm. And I say she had true warrior spirit, true warrior mentality as well, because did you know, Miss Shirley Chisholm survived not one, not two, not three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10, but 11 
11 assassination attempts took place on the life of this black woman, Shirley Chisholm. But still, she said, her head would be unbowed and her person, her spirit would be unbought and unbossed. There was a, there's a rare interview where an interviewer asked her about those assassination attempts and she modestly and humbly and strongly uh, talked about how she you know, didn't, didn't necessarily wanna get into that subject. She didn't wanna talk about that. She didn't wanna give any energy or, or credence to those cowards who would seek to, through fear and intimidation, silence her. Strong, strong woman whose body was imbued with the strength of those Jamaican Maroon fighters of Queen Nanny, Shirley Chisholm. Again, we're talking about freedom. That's all we talk about. You're listening to the Just of Freedom radio show. You can find over 300 previous recordings that I've, listened, that I've been listened to over, I believe, 30,000 times, if my memory serves me correctly, at the blackhistoryuniversity.com, blackhistoryuniversity.com is where you can find previous shows. Black365.com is where you can find a number of educational products suitable for all ages. We know that people are doing homeschool right now and supplementing their child's education at home like they've never done before. Blackhistoryuniversity.com is a great, great resource where you can feel more emboldened, feel more enlightened, and feel more educated about our freedom. Blackhistoryuniversity.com, black365.com is where you can find some educational products that can supplement that education as well. Take a look at this picture right here. This is a beautiful picture that shows the entrance to Shirley Chisholm State Park. Again, when someone has done something so honorable, so valiant, so recognizable that beyond their life, they should be remembered, records should show, history should reflect, monuments should be built in their honor. That is what a life well lived seems to me. And here we see Shirley Chisholm State Park in the state of New York. This place has over 400 acres, has over 35,000 trees, has native grass and shrubs and woodlands. This uh, was dedicated uh, to Shirley Chisholm some years back. Um, to the Northwest, you can see the Empire State Building. To the South, you can see Jamaica Bay. Check out the irony there. Check out the divine connection. I use that word divine purposefully because uh, going back into the Bible, even the Bible talks about uh, memorials. The Bible talks about um, having contained mementos for remembering what you've gone through. Uh, the manna from heaven in the book of Exodus, uh, those people fleeing from harsh realities were given sustenance, given substances from heaven in the form of manna, the story says, and they were instructed to keep that manna in jars in order to remember the goodness, in order to remember the grace that came to them from heaven. And again, mementos, memorials, statues are also important. They tell a story that can be passed through generations that people can touch, they can feel, they can connect with the energy of a thing. Jamaica Bay, as I mentioned, can be seen from Shirley Chisholm State Park that's in the New York area, but there's also a Jamaica Bay that is connected with Boston and connected with this man, David Walker. David Walker is a phenomenal man. Each and every person should have the name of David Walker in their collective memory, should have the name of David Walker on their tongues. You should teach your children about David Walker. David Walker was an upright man. He was an honest man. He was a bold man. He was an uncompromising man. He was born free, if I'm not mistaken, in the year of 1825, and he settled in Boston. In Boston, he was connected with Boston's Jamaica Bay. He was a writer. 
He was an entrepreneur. He loved the sea and the ocean and seafaring ways. And he owned a clothing shop. From what I've been able to gather, his shop would be considered, in today's terms, somewhat of like a secondhand store, right? Where he sold clothing, sold clothing to sailors, sold clothing to the general public. And he would also tailor and make alterations to the clothing. He wrote what is popularly known as David Walker's Appeal. And in this appeal, he made an appeal to the colored people of the world. He had that freedom message in his mind, that freedom message in his heart, and he wanted to share that message of freedom. He appealed to the masses of black people all throughout the world. The message of abolition was not simply contained to the Northeast of these United States. No, this was an international message with an international flair, international overtures and overtones. And David Walker did all that he could to ensure that this freedom loving message this message of abolition, this message of freedom by any means necessary, even before the great Malcolm X, David Walker talked about freedom by any means necessary. Again, he wrote a small book or some writings that, are known, that is known as David Walker's Appeal. And in this appeal, he appealed to the mind and the consciousness of all people that Africa's seeds, Africa's beloved children, African people, wherever they were at, in the world must be free, particularly the, these Africans who were here in the shores of North America and here in the Caribbean as well. He particularly appealed to the island of Jamaica. He was, as I mentioned, a fantastic writer, a deep scholar, a deep researcher, and he had statistics about the peopling of Jamaica. He wrote, that Jamaica had roughly 15,000 colonizers or Europeans or uh, British folks in particular. And he said that there were over 300,000 individuals of African descent who composed, who made up, who populated Jamaica. He said, look, if we cannot appeal to the minds and hearts of these people and negotiate our freedom, we must take our freedom by choice. We must take our freedom by force, excuse me. He said he would oftentimes uh, write, excuse me, he would oftentimes send his writings to Jamaica with people, not just simply in their hands, not just simply uh, uh, in their pockets, but as I mentioned, he would use the resources he had. He would use his shop and take the clothing, take the garments, take the shirts and sew hidden pockets in the clothing. And inside those pockets, he would have the message of his appeal. He would have the David Walker's appeal sewn into clandestine pockets in the shirts and in the garments of the people that were traveling to and for. That's how he spread this writing, spread this message. He was so feared for his intellect, so feared for his mind, so feared for his writing that there were people who put out a bounty on David Walker, both here in the United States, in the South, as well as in Jamaica. They said $3,000 would be given to the person who would kill David Walker. Some say they would offer $10,000 if they would bring him to the South alive. David Walker, I'm sure to his dying day, stood strong, stood bold, and lived like he wrote with honor. David Walker ultimately was murdered, murdered for his words, murder, murdered for being a freedom fighter, for being a freedom seeker, for spreading the word, spreading the message of freedom. Again, you were listening to the Gist of Freedom radio show where we connect the past with the present, we make history a living thing. Blackhistoryuniversity.com is where you can find it. I encourage you to check out some of our past messages and some of our past broadcasts. You will sure, I'm sure that you will be inspired, uplifted, and informed. 
David Walker, again, was not just one of these people who pontificated, was not just one of these people who talked and wrote to hear himself write, but this man was a true scholar. Again, born free. I oftentimes like to point out that our brothers and sisters who in the 1800s were born free, they had a choice. They had a choice to choose to live life as if the struggle of their brother was not their struggle because it was not their struggle. David Walker never felt the chains, never felt the manacles of enslavement, never felt the sea in a, the belly of a boat. He did not come to this country on a ship himself. He was born free, settled in Boston. However, he dedicated his life. He dedicated his energy. He dedicated all that he had to research, to writing, to, to the liberation of African people. David Walker, to the best of my knowledge, did not have a mathematical background. However, he had tremendous, intricate, detailed stats about the number of people black, the number of people white, the number of square feet and square miles and kilometers of the island of Jamaica and other islands in the Caribbean. And he said that no way, by no stretch of the imagination, by no conceivable manner, should one, nearly 1% 1 of the people in Jamaica dominate the other 99%. Again, the British in Jamaica made up roughly 15,000 people. There were over 300, some say 350,000 individuals of African descent. No way, David Walker said, that we should lay down, that, she, that we should allow ourselves to be subjugated, allow ourselves to be oppressed, allow ourselves to be dominated in the fashion that we were in Jamaica. African people had never seen the level of brutality had never seen the level of merciless killing, had never seen an industrial complex like the Europeans, like the British had fashioned. We had never seen chattel slavery. That did not exist. The word, the concept, the idea of enslaving someone from the time that they were born to the time that they die, working someone for free, getting free labor, enslaving the offspring of someone. This did not exist in Africa. There were no large scale wars in Africa prior to the coming of Europeans. So people are oftentimes asked, how was it even possible that Europeans were able to create such a peculiar institution, were able to create chattel slavery I say that we were um, bombarded by even a wicked mentality that did not exist in Africa. That is how we were forced into this peculiar institution for multiple centuries. But again, we honor, we praise, we hold high the name of David Walker because he used his time his energy and his resources. We all have time, we all have energy, and we all have resources. But how we utilize that time, that energy, and our resources will determine if we will live forever in infamy or live forever honorably. And again, David Walker overtly and covertly spread the message of his appeal to African people throughout the world and we honor and we appreciate him. Again, asymmetrical warfare, being clandestine, doing things in a guerrilla fashion is how we had to move and how we had to operate. Let me go back to Queen Nanny. Let's go back to this image of Jamaica. In the Blue Mountains on what they call the windward side of the mountain, on the eastern side is where she had her maroons. She along with the others, again, had to find ways to sustain life and have community. And one thing that's important in community, obviously, is food. We as African people constantly come together around food, right? And so 
uh, as I mentioned, they, they being the members of Maroons would go at night and have raids on the plantations where they would steal cows, steal goats and steal chickens. And they would take those back to the Maroons. And now, as I mentioned, these were clandestine living arrangements, right? There was no sign that said, hey, there's a Maroon town, this is where we're hanging out at. No, they were tucked away. And some may ask, how was it that they would have communities? How do you cook? How do you uh, uh, season your food? How do you eat? Again, how do you cook uh, and be clandestine? Well, we all know jerk chicken, right? We've heard of jerk chicken. Many of us will travel miles and miles and miles to this day to get some good jerk chicken. I, I live here in the Los Angeles area, and I can think of a place like Derek's Jamaican Cuisine. Hey, we might need to get a uh, sponsorship from him. Uh, Derek Jamaican uh, Cuisine, will, people will travel for hours to go there to get some uh, good old jerk chicken. Uh, for those who may not know and listen to the audience what jerk chicken is, it's uh, chicken that has been seasoned and prepared and has a whole host of, again, seasonings on it. But the original jerk chicken, did you know, was actually cooked in clay pots and sometimes, oftentimes, cooked underground. That's right. Jerk chicken originally, in its original form, was cooked underneath the earth. And you ask, why was that so? Again, warfare was taking place for decades in the Blue Mountains, in these maroon towns, by Queen Nanny and others, Cujo and others. And so one of the intelligent ways that they uh, devised in order to hide their um, uh, location was the invention of these pits, these smoke pits and these clay pots and covering the chicken with the herbs and spices and all this taste goods, but oftentimes would smell good, but that smell, that aroma, that smoke cannot give away their location. And so again, they invented earthing pots and um, other clay pots where they devised a system where they would have a cool pot in the earth next to a warm pot, and this would preserve the food uh, almost like a re early um, uh, uh, refrigeration system, as well as they had earthened ovens. Queen Nanny, there is a movie that uh, depicts her. Uh, the name of that movie is escaping me at the moment, uh, but there are, are, are depictions of her and depictions of Maroon Towns. Uh, PBS, uh, Public Broadcasting Service, did a, um, did a piece on maroon towns and maroon nations. There you can check out more about Queen Nanny and they did an okay job of uh, uncovering or shedding light or highlighting what it was like to live in some of these maroon towns. Again, these were places where freedom seeking people, freedom loving people lived away from colonization where they kept the spirit of freedom alive. Again, you're listening to me your host, Mr. Black365, Jamal Brown, uh, creator of Black365.com and its educational products on the Gist of Freedom radio show. You can find some of our previous broadcasts at BlackHistoryUniversity.com, BlackHistoryUniversity.com. As I mentioned, there are a number of people who called Jamaica home. There are a number of people who were inspired and empowered by Jamaica. Jamaica has been in the news. Again, here at Just a Freedom Radio Show, we constantly, constantly, constantly ensure that we keep up to date with the uh, facts and keep up to date with the uh, current events. And so we're going to, in just in a few moments, uh, talk about how Jamaica is currently in the news. Did you know that Maroons existed here in the United States as well? Again, those freedom seeking folks like Harriet, she wasn't the only one who took the Underground Railroad to freedom. There were Maroons here where again Africans lived, Africans worked, Africans uh, fought. Uh, one of them uh, we, we refer to uh, the Dismal Swamp uh, was a hideaway for Maroons here in Jamaica. It runs along uh, North Carolina. 
there are islands off of the Carolinas where we get the term Gullah from, Gullah Geechee. Uh, again, languages and people and ways of life where African people lived, worked, and struggled at. Uh, again, the islands off of the, uh, the, off of the Carolinas, known as the Gullah Islands, that still exist to this day. They're remnants of the language, remnants of the culture. The people still live and maintain history and culture today. Again, those dismal swamps there in North Carolina uh, runs along uh, the Carolinas, uh, where again, people lived and maintained culture. They say that these are some of the most African places in existence in the West. You can go to the Gullah Islands, or you can go to the Dismal Swamp, and you can see Africa still in existence. What I mean by that is history, culture, language, the way that they weave their baskets, the way that they have their hair is very, very much in line and intact with Africa, despite being separated by thousands of miles and hundreds of years, Africa is still intact in parts of the Carolinas. Again, there's a place called the Dismal Swamp. There's actually a website, uh, dismalswampwelcomecenter.com. Um, there, it talks about the over 1,550 sites of the Civil War Trail uh, that exists actually throughout six states where individuals of African descent uh, lived and built communities and fought behind enemy lines. Behind enemy lines, they were maintaining culture and they were fighting. I always, always, always like to dismell the myth of the happy-go-lucky of the smiling slave. I always like to struggle against, fight against, speak against the concept, the idea, the notion that overwhelmingly African people were content with their lot in life, that they were content with their place, that they were content with slavery. That beyond a shadow of, doubt, of a doubt was not true. The masses of our people lived their life, dedicated each and every waking moment of their life to freedom. Our people knew of the grandeur knew of the pleasant trees, knew of the greatness of Mama Africa. We knew that our creator created us free, like all things are free. And by and large, we did not simply roll over and accept colonization, accept the peculiar institution. Again, if you knew the horrors of enslavement, if you knew of the castrations and the burnings and the kidnappings and the sexual assaults, if you could picture for one minute and internalize the idea of having your mother sold in this direction and your offspring sold in this direction and your husband sold in this direction, you would know that no person with a conscience, no person with a soul would simply accept this form of life. And so in the dismal swamps, in the maroon towns of Jamaica, and the maroon towns of the United States, we constantly and consistently had people fighting for the, our liberation. Going back to these uh, dismal swamps, George Washington um, actually uh, had issues with uh, the Maroon Towns, uh, the, the, the Dismal Swamps produced hemp. Uh, in those uh, Carolinas, uh, indigo was a large crop and also hemp, which has multi-facets. Hemp can uh, produce clothing, hemp can produce rope, hemp can produce all sorts of uh, industrial uh, items. Uh, George Washington drudged the swamp for all of his hemp to keep an eye on anyone, uh, anyone else from selling uh, hemp or uh, over Tabasco, uh, I almost said Tabasco, uh, tobacco. Again, those Carolinas are known for indigo, uh, hemp, and tobacco. And uh, George Washington uh, was in the business of uh, tobacco 
and he uh, despised the people who were uh, utilizing the uh, dismal swamps uh, for various reasons. The Fabulous History of the Dismal Swamp Company, a story of George Washington's times by Charles Rooster is a place, is a reference for you. Let me say that one more time. Uh, when I get excited, I talk fast, my producer and others. My mother even said, slow down a bit. Uh, you gotta reach, you gotta teach, you gotta educate the people, so you gotta slow down a bit. Let me give you that name one more time. Uh, the Fabulous History of the Dismal Swamp Company, a story of George Washington Times by Charles uh, Royster, R-O-Y-S-T-R. Royster is where you can find out more information about the Dismal Swamp, the uh, place that many Africans called home, where they lived, where they plotted, where they planned their escape for themselves and escaped for others. Uh, also a place where again, hemp was uh, produced um, is where we can find out more uh, information about our folks. Again, we started off this show talking about history and its importance. History um, being a clock, history being a compass, history being a tool that we use to tell our political time of day and find out who we are, where we've been, and where we still must go. We talked about Jamaica. Again, I'm giving a recap here. Many of our listeners have given us feedback saying, hey, we love the show. And so uh, many of them are using it as a lesson plan, using it as a foundation to teach history and encourage uh, conversation in their homes. We are open here at the Gist of Freedom to your input. Please, please, please provide us with your feedback on topics that you would like us to cover, topics that you would like us to shed a spotlight on, topics that you would like us to hit hard, topics that are important to you and that you believe others should learn about. You can email our uh, producer at Leslie, L-E-S-L-E-Y, again, L-E-S-L-E-Y, at thegistoffreedom.com, thegistoffreedom.com. Guests, we would like to hear from you. Guests, we would like, uh, audience members, we would like to hear from you. We would like to know uh, guests that you would like us to uh, interview. Your favorite historian, uh, someone that may not necessarily be known in the national uh, 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 scape, uh, the national landscape, but uh, that person in your family who may be a historian, a keeper of the records, uh, a historian, a librarian, uh, again, a local figure, a national figure, please do let us know. Uh, we, are, we want some Black History, uh, Black History Scouts. You and the listening audience, you are our eyes and ears. You give us our lifeblood. You let us know where we should go in terms of the direction of who we interview, who we bring on this show. You can use the hashtag Black History Scout. Again, we want, just like Madam C.J. Walker had thousands of Walker agents who uh, distributed, distributed the message of, uh, of uh, Madam C.J. Walker, we want Black History Scouts here at the Gist of Freedom Radio who are our lookouts, who are our eyes and ears in the field, if you will. So again, use the hashtag Black History Scout and let us know who you know, who you would like to see us bring here on the show. We want to share your pictures. We want to share your stories of your family history, of your city's history, of your area's history. Again, we have this theme that we're working on where we are discovering and uncovering and shining a spotlight on memorials, uh, statues, uh, placards, lands, fields, plantations, anything that has been memorialized that you would like us to uh, shine a spotlight on, please, please, please share with us information about it, share with us pictures and stories, and we can possibly bring you on to the show so that you can share more information about this living history, these memorials. Uh, also, let us know information about places that are sacred and holy to you and that should be memorialized, places that have yet been honored, yet been stamped, yet a landmark has been placed uh, on them, but you know that they were sacred and holy places that made uh, 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 life better for our people. Please, also uh, endangered places, places as we know have been uh, dilapidated, uh, places that have uh, be been neglected, places that have not been given the wherewithal and upkeep that they should. 
Um, again, we know that many uh, of our historic uh, colleges, some HBCUs, I can think of Morris Brown, for example, in Georgia, who had to close its door some years back. Many of these places of higher education have been uh, neglected. Uh, these, 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 these small one house, uh, one room, um, one room shacks and one room uh, schoolhouses that still exist to this day. Again, let us know. We do know that some of, uh, some of our people still own land, still have acres that have been passed down throughout generations. Again, we wanna to talk to those farmers, we wanna to talk to those landowners who have still uh, have the land that they grew up on, land that was sacred to them. We wanna interview you. Again, use the hashtag Black History Scout Again, I am your host, Jamal Brown, AKA Mr. Black 365, founder and creator of the educational products at 365.com. They are suitable for all ages. They help supplement the education that is taking place in the homes and in the schools uh, right now. You are listening to one of the best radio stations, one of the best radio shows, one of the best shows anywhere in the world, that being the Gist of Freedom radio show powered by blackhistoryuniversity.com. Always, always, always would like to give a shout out to our illustrious producer, Miss Leslie. I call her Miss Leslie Gist, Gist the Freedom radio show. Um, this here has been another exciting episode. Please leave comments. As I mentioned, let us know the direction that you would like to take us. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon on the next episode. Peace.